next speaker is Mei, and we'll be learning about uh, modular and reusable physical design flow. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as he said, my name is Nairi Kristofowitz. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, uh, and today I'll be talking about the VLSI flow tool that we use at, at Berkeley. Uh, so first I'll go over some of the drawbacks of typical uh, VLSI flows. I'll talk about how we tried to address that with Hammer. Uh, I'll go through, basically we offer a tutorial, and, and so I'll kind of go through how you could run that um, by yourself uh, at home, and then uh, I'll give an overview of what Hammer has been used for to give you an idea of what else you could use, what we could use it for. Um, so starting with traditional VLSI flows, um, basically every VLSI flow starts with the design you want to um, physically implement, the technology you want to implement it in, um, and the tools that take you from this RTL to GDS, basically the layout file. Uh, now the problem is these VLSI flows are custom built for each project. Uh, they have to be tailored to a specific design, tech, and tool combination, and for you know a different design, a different technology, an updated tool, everything changes, or at least a lot of it does. And yeah, basically these are bundled into these non-reusable tickle scripts or, or other scripts, and a lot of the design intent and expertise is kind of lost once one of these things changes, um, and it really doesn't promote reusability. Um, so I'll give an example of how tightly coupled these three concerns are. So we have the power grid in, for physical design. It basically it takes the power from the package pins and drops them down to the logic gates uh, of your design. Um, so this is an example of the command that the, the tool would take and interpret and, and actually create your power straps. Um, so this is just for one particular layer, and then you would repeat for four additional layers. So First, we have our tool-specific uh, par parts of this command. Um, so it's specific syntax, specific arguments, the commands themselves. This changes across different tools. They look pretty similar, but you'd have to rewrite this if you switched CAD tools, say, from Cadence Inovus to Open Road. Um, next, you have your text-specific um, specifications, things like the, the metal layer name, um, the, the minimum spacing, the minimum width, uh, in that PDK, that's going to change drastically across uh, different technologies, especially as you're scaling. Um, and then you have your design-specific um, constraints, things like uh, your net names, your module names, the density of your power straps that changes depending on what you're, what you're taping out, what your requirements are. So that's kind of what we went into designing Hammer, like thinking of all these things. First, we, we thought we, we need a separation of these concerns. Uh, that's an absolute requirement um, so that we can, we can plug and play these um, as, as our, our flows change, our requirements change across uh, different chips. The second was standardization. Again, we talked about um, tickle scripts being mostly what these tools ingest, um, among other things. But what we want is a standardized format where we can pass constraints between tools. Uh, so this, we, we feel like something like a JSON or YAML, something that's human readable, um, it can be passed along, um, works best. Uh, the next thing is modularity. We want to be able to interchange tool and technology plugins um, so that we can swap out CAD tools or swap out technologies and have to do minimum configuration to get this new flow to work. And the last thing is incremental adoption. We want to mix what is reusable, kind of the core of our VLSI tool, um, but also allow as much customization as possible so that uh, for more complex chips or things like one-time solutions, those are still possible to sort of inject custom tickle or you know, whatever else you might want to do that's just specific to a one-time chip. Um, so you know, what is Hammer? Uh, how did we end up doing that? So, Essentially, it's just a Python framework for abstracting and building standardized flows. It's just a bunch of Python that, that takes in some constraints, um, writes out scripts um, to, to a particular CAD tool, and then manages the tool execution and maybe does some, some processing after the tool runs. Um, we've used it anywhere from architectural exploration to teaching to uh, more complicated research chips. Um, and it's fully open source. Yeah, it started in 2015, um, and then we kind of have a, a range of research chips that have used it 
uh, since then and it's gone many iterations and kind of the design cycle is as we tape out something interesting we'll upstream anything useful that came out of that tape out uh, and so Hammer continues to, to grow and develop. Um, so this is the basic Hammer architecture. I won't go into too many details here but basically you can see um, I won't be able to get a pointer. I'm not that savvy but um, yeah so there's core Hammer uh, things that can be reused across Anything, basically, anyone, anytime anyone uses a VLSI flow, uh, these, these are shared across uh, everything. And then your tool plugin, so specific to CAD tools that you use, and then a technology plugin that is also interchangeable. Um, and, then, and then various like YAML specifications uh, through that I'll try to, try to summarize. But um, kind of the first thing is uh, the Hammer Intermediate Representation, or IR. Uh, kind of reference that throughout. It, it's basically just the JSON YAML uh, format. Um, it's any of the constraints, um, any options that we specify, like any state that Hammer has is in this format, which is why we call it the, the IR. Um, it, it's in the form of YAML if it's like human input, and then JSON is dumped between uh, each step in the VLSI flow. Uh, and so it allows these to be mixed, both like the human input as well as a kind of hammer um, dumping out the, the constraints that it has. Um, and then these, uh, you would kind of allow like IR meta programming, like certain keys can override other keys or reference other keys, um, not, not super important yet. But basically um, the rest, instead of like summarizing the parts, like you can basically start with the hammer defaults. Like at the core, you have a bunch of um, YAML keys that basically they're, they're mostly null values, but they, they kind of set some sensible defaults. You have your, your tool IR, which is just more, more configuration, your technology, uh, and your design. So again, sort of the three components of, of the VLSI flow. Um, how do these fit together? Basically, you start with your defaults. Again, usually null placeholders, but things that'll be shared throughout, things like clock name or uh, power pin name, stuff like that, it'll be shared uh, across everything. Uh, tool concerns. Again, more Hammer IR, but things that are specific to a CAD tool, things like the tools binary path that's specific to that one tool. Um, but these tool plugins, basically, they will generate the tool scripts, they'll execute the tools. Sometimes they'll do some error parsing depending on how the, the tool plugin was set up. Um, and then the technology plugin kind of overrides the tool and the Hammer defaults. So now the technology can also have its own configs, things like the path to the PDK, um, but it can also override, you know, tool or default IR. Um, another useful thing about the tech plugin is um, it can modify your PDK. So say there was like a bug in the PDK files, uh, it can take it, hack it, cache it, uh, and that way you have a programmatic way um, of modifying these files so that the next person using that PDK doesn't run into the same issues. Uh, I will mention this is where memory compilation happens, so SRAMs um, as well, and uh, the, the tech plugin can also uh, inject hooks. So whereas the tool sets the steps of whatever, if, if it's par, or like place and route, uh, has a, a series of steps, the technology can inject hooks and kind of customize that. Um, and then at the last level is the design. So this is specific just to your current design, um, whatever you know, tool technology and design combination you use, and that's going to override everything before that, just whatever the design or things like the clock period, they're going to set that for that particular design, and they can inject some more flow hooks, again, custom to that chip that they're, they're implementing. Um, so next I'll just go through kind of what you would need to do uh, to run this uh, open source tutorial. Uh, so basically, we go back to our VLSI flow. Um, but for this tutorial, we have as our design a tiny RISC-V rocket, uh, SOC. Uh, for our technology, we have the Skywater 130 nanometers. And for uh, tools, we have the full open source uh, tool suite. So uh, first, with the design, this is roughly the block diagram of what we're, what we're going to push through the flow. Uh, it's generated through Chipyard. It will talk about that uh, tomorrow, I think. Um, but I will note that it's not just the rocket core. Um, it's also like the caches that go with it, as well as all of the buses and some digital peripherals. Uh, so it is you know, much beefier than just a RISC-V, and kind of will make this, this tutorial like pretty non-trivial. Um, yeah, so the technology, we've probably all heard of the Sky 130. Uh, that's what we used. We support that. Um, 
And then for the tools, we have uh, Yosis, Open Road, KLayout, Magic, and NetGen uh, to implement it, where, uh, again, yeah, Chipyard generates the RTL, and then we go um, Yosis for synthesis, Open Road for place and route, KLayout writes, uh, writes out the GDS, and then Magic and NetGen for verification. Uh, and Cam Hammer stitches all those together, uh, and we have sort of plugins for all of the CAD tools, and then Hammer is sort of integrated within Chipyard, and I'll kind of try to demonstrate how that works. Um, yeah, so our tutorial, uh, there's a link. We'd love it if you uh, tried it out. Um, but basically, uh, to get it to run, you just like clone Chipyard. Um, go into Chipyard, there's a bunch of setup that's like separate from the VLSI part that you just have to do. Um, and then you go into the VLSI directory, and that's where all of the VLSI specific stuff is going to reside. So if you then wanted to go do sim, you would you know, go to a different part of Chipyard. So the VLSI part is where we basically focus on. Um, there's also some tutorial setup, uh, like additional setup for the VLSI part. Mainly it's installing all of the required CAD tools in the PDK through Conda, which is now possible. Um, so you can just, if you have a Linux machine, you can run everything. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the first thing, um, on the left you can see like the, uh, the tutorial commands. It's pretty simple, it's a make-based flow, so it's just make sin, par, DRC, LVS. And then we just select this tutorial, uh, which is Skyline 30 Open Road, uh, mainly because we have like multiple flavors of these tutorials. We have like also an ASAP 7 and a Skyline 30 commercial version uh, with commercial CAD tools. So this is the only fully open source one. Um, but to note here, Basically, the, the main things that this make variable does is it first it selects the config coming from Chipyard, which is the tiny rocket config. So the first thing that will happen is uh, your RTL is generated uh, for this SOC. Uh, then it selects a tools um, config file. So again, we talked about like tools, then tech overriding tools, and then design overrides both of those. Uh, so we already kind of wrote out the, the configs that we would need um, for this tutorial, and we can see at the bottom the input configs again left to right, like the right always overrides the left. Um, so I'll kind of be pointing to those different files um, as as we go through like the different configurations. Yeah. So for the the tool configuration, the example open road YAML file, um, basically you select your tool plugins, and this is already like in the file. But then you would also add the paths to the binaries that you installed and following the tutorial. Um, for your technology configuration, uh, you just select your tech plugin um, and then specify the paths to both your PDK and also uh, your SRAMs. Um, when you actually execute the, um, the commands, it, it like calls the hammer generated make file. So um, in addition to like we can see these, um, these YAML files being included, but it also the make file generates some of its own YAMLs as well as the uh, SRAM generator output that points to all of the uh, SRAM files. Uh, so these are things that are just already guided by, by Hammer. And then for the make par additionally, uh, it kind of generates a flow graph um, in, in the back end. Um, so make par not only calls the place and route, but it also calls like the synthesis to place and route uh, step that just takes all the outputs from th synthesis and, you know, um, places them to, to make them available for, for PAR. Um, one thing I'll note, so, so you can see that the, the user specified configs are only um, in the synthesis step, and from then on out, it's only the hammer IR generated, so only the JSONs being passed. Um, if you do say you want to change like a floor plan um, constraint, so you know as the designer that that is only affecting place and route, all you do is you add um, this make variable and you just point to your modified file and it, it immediately overrides whatever was coming out of synthesis before. So it, it doesn't force you to, to rerun synthesis. Um, there are many more modifications, um, but kind of for the interest of time. Um, yeah, so I'll kind of uh, show the demo now. Um, we'll focus on par uh, since uh, I think that's the most interesting step of the flow. Um, so that is running open road, uh, which I think there's a talk on that later too. Uh, so basically, when you first run that command, uh, we'll kind of open the GUI uh, at each of these intermediate steps, because uh, I think it's interesting to kind of see how the configs affect uh, the layout. Uh, so we can see uh, it's just a blank uh, design right now. Uh, the first thing you usually do is you specify your floor plan constraints. This is at the design level. Again, we, we kind of thought, oh, our, our SSC is a 4 by 3 millimeter. So now you can see like the 
thin rectangle. Um, next, again, at the design level, you place your SRAM uh, macros for the data cache. Uh, then you place your iCache and your tag array. Um, now, for example, the next step is like tap cells. Uh, this is not something you have to do at the design level. It's, it's a universal, like once you're using Sky130, the tap cell um, interval is always defined in the PDK. So it was already specified um, in the PDK for you. Uh, so, so as you can see, like the interval um, is set to be 15 and we can see the, the interval between them is, is around that number. Um, the same thing for power straps, we kind of used that as the case study before. Uh, this is on the design side now because we kind of want to specify these custom straps. Um, so, for example, like the metal five um, constraints are, are shown um, in the blue, and it kind of places those those power straps. Um, and then, likewise, for metal four, it places those with with that utilization, that um, spacing, and so on. You kind of um, specify those. Um, but then, when you actually drop from metal four to metal one, which is the the standard cell metal layer. That's again going to be universal because these standard cells are now now um, just universal. Like you use the same ones for for this PDK. Uh, so that's in your tech plugin. Uh, so that's again not something specified by the user. That was something specified by the expert who set up like the Sky One Thirty plugin. So um, now I can switch to like the the placement density view. Uh, before we were just showing the normal view. It won't change. Like this layout won't change for a while. Uh, so we're switching to placement density. Um, basically, there's a bunch of configurations that were exposed to the open road flow. Things like for global placement, uh, we selected to have it both be timing driven and routability um, driven. Um, and then we just kind of keep going. Placing pins is at the design level. And we see that it iterates through. And then for um, the routing steps, again, we, we expose some useful configs uh, that kind of let us uh, close the design. And you can see the final layout. Uh, for our tiny rocket SOC config. This takes about uh, six hours on like pretty fast machines, um, but yeah, there are ways you can speed it up that are, are discussed in the tutorial if you want to run something faster. Um, yeah, so what can you make? Basically, we've, we've used Hammer with a lot of different um, PDKs. Uh, most of those aren't able to be open source, just, just the open source technologies, but now we've open sourced our tool plugins, so anything from Cadence and Synopsys. Um, it's just like publicly available uh, in Hammer. Um, we've kind of taped out a huge range of chips, as you can see, like very different frequencies, um, process technologies. Uh, so it kind of shows that Hammer is able to both uh, produce very high performance chips, but also very small, like low power chips. Um, and we've also used it in courses. So we use it in our digital intro to digital design classes, um, as well as the tape out class. Uh, that we've started running in the last couple of years. So this, this, this is um, the chips coming out of the, the tape out class. Um, yeah, and I'll just wrap up here. I have some documentation um, linked. Uh, we run tutorials, yeah, at all the conferences. It's kind of with the Chipyard uh, fire some folks. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, also acknowledgments. Like this, this is um, work done by many Hammer and Chipyard developers. Um, it's kind of work sponsored by um, our lab member companies and then uh, through DARPA Craft and NSF. Uh, yeah, any questions? Yes. Thanks for the talk, that was great. Um, I'm wondering, you know, uh, the Hammerfall has been around, around for a while and there have been new nodes that mm -hmm. have come along uh, as we've gone. Has, like, what kinds of unforeseen issues do you tend to hit when you start on a new tech process? Um, yeah. I'm interested to hear about that. Um, I think the biggest is the random DRC issues. Yeah, and having to then circle back and maybe like add some hooks into the place and route flow. Um, yeah, for like, because I've only used this guy, or I wrote this guy in 30 PDK uh, plugin. Um, yeah, and it was things like different power pin names from what the tools used to, so no, none of the power um, was connected. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like it kind of varies. SRAM integration is also, I think, the tricky, uh, very tricky part. Yeah. So it is definitely non-trivial. We're starting on GF180, and uh, that might take us a bit. Yeah. Cool. Sorry, I have a quick question. So mm -hmm. uh, the open source versus proprietary commercial tools, how, like... Because when you run them side by side like this, you must get a good feel for which ones are maybe uh, easier to use. Or, but 
can you talk a little bit to the results you get out of the open source flow that you showed here mm -hmm. and then the results you get when you use like the proprietary cadence tools? Yeah, I would say the density is much better for uh, proprietary tools, um, but kind of the quality of the results varies a lot more because it, it seemed like the, the commercial tools will kind of force something through and they'll, they'll finish. Whereas like open road will just say, oh, it's, it's too congested, I can't do it. But every, every design that did come out of open road was always like, at least every time I checked it was DRC and LVS clean, which sometimes in like uh, the commercial tools, like something will have shorted. It like did its best, but I, I didn't constrain it very well. So I think that's one of the big things. Um, timing has been tricky to meet with open source, uh, a little easier with commercial. Yeah, I would say the density is pretty significant. And I think runtime, Currently, um, yeah, the commercial tool is much faster, at least in place and route. Um, but yeah, I would say the, the GUI is much faster to load with uh, open road. So yeah, it's been great to work with. <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, so you've got this tutorial that does a Sky 130 chip. Mm -hmm. um, does it go into how you can actually go and get that manufactured, like submitting to the MPW and complying with those type of requirements? No, um, I feel like a next step would be like um, integrating it in with our pad frame and then and then actually submitting it. Yeah, we currently we did have like a digital top way of doing it, but it was it was a little more. Um, yeah, it, it's definitely not been released yet. It, thanks, great talk. Um, I had a question. So, in my experience with like cadence flows, they tend to like like top down synthesis and place and route and mm -hmm. stuff, and synopsis tends to like bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, how do you reconcile that with Hammer? Uh, we don't use synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> yeah, we've been meaning to. So, but yeah, it does take a lot to support each tool. I will say, Open Road was a lot more difficult to set up than I expected. Um, so, in our future, we are trying to go back to using synopsis tools like in parallel, but that will be very tricky to maintain like three, three tool flows. Yeah. Just a quick question. Uh, do you know of anyone that using your tool, this tool flow for uh, Skywater 90? No, and I don't think we had plans to support that. Um, I think we thought like for digital it wasn't as good. I forget the exact reasoning. So I think we were going to focus on GF180. Uh, but I think if there was a lot of demand, we could definitely look into it. Yeah. I think one of the RAMs were one of the biggest difficulties with Sky130. GF180 has its own SRAMs, but we, uh, we had to write our own SRAM generator for, uh, like the, yeah, these ones in here were, um, are generated like in-house. Um, I, I had a question. So you said that you've used this for both a um, tape out class and then a, a digital design class. I would amend that. Um, okay. Yeah, just we we haven't used the Sky One Thirty part for for the classes. But you have. But used, Hammer, oh, yes. Hammer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you talk more about how you've used it uh, for just the digital design class and not actually like taping something up? Yeah, basically we have a series of labs and it uses like Hammer. Um, not as a part of Chipyard, so you know the standard like GCD and like add one SRAM, see what it does. Um, yeah, so the students will basically there's a series of labs. You know they start with simulation and then synthesis, place and route, everything. Um, they are very condensed. I think there's only like four labs that actually dive into the PD. Um, and basically you run the make command and then kind of go look at the the collateral that's generated. Um, like Hammer will dump out like a very simple SDC file that it, it's generated. So students will like go and open this SDC file and just look at it. Um, I will say that is a trade-off of having a like generator-based VLSI flow tool uh, because if student like if it's kind of generated for them, students do a lot less of the like um, like modifying the file, so they have a worse understanding of it. But um, yeah. So uh, in the beginning, you were talking a bit about IP cores as well, mm -hmm. uh, talk about the whole flow from IP cores to all the way to GDS. So do you have anything for IP cores, like any format for, for uh, describing your designs? Yeah, um, not 
too much. We don't really use them too much. Yeah. So I would I wouldn't know unless it was something custom done for a chip before my time. Yeah. yeah there haven't. are some great alternatives out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, nice nice talk. Uh, one question. Do you do gate level simulation at the end? Yes. So you're able to do. And now the other question that I have, sometimes you have commands like set the delay that it can break the simulations, but you don't, since you are using for education, how do you test that they don't put commands that then suddenly generate some RTL, but in fact it's not correct because it breaks the semantics of the RTL. Do you have anything for checking on that? No. Because Wait. you are saying that you're using for education, so the students can start to put commands that makes the, s the synthesis not realistic, not correct. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I guess students rarely like insert their own tool commands, or I, I don't see any reason that they would. Um, but I guess if the gate level simulation fails, then like it doesn't work. After yeah. Oh, after you're saying? No, 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 no. It's oh. After as with gate level. Yes, but uh, to note, we don't have like an open source way of gate level sims. We just use like Synopsis VCS. Um, have you done any comparison of your chipyard and hammer versus things like Fusoc or Silicon Compiler or other options out there? Yeah, not yet. I think, um, yeah, we would need to like integrate the, the VLSI flow in with the chipyard designs so that we had like these kind of complex designs in both. Um, but that would be very interesting. Yeah, we should definitely do that. How modular are the tech files versus the tool files? For example, can you take the Sky 130 tech lib and use it with Open Road and Cadence, or is there a special tech to, uh, file to be adapted to each individual tool, fl tool flow? I see. Um, mostly, it's it works with both. Basically, initially we wrote the Sky 130 plugin to work with commercial tools, so it was using the standard like libs, left, whatever. Um, but then when we added the open road um, compatibility, we had to add paths to a couple more like open source um, file formats. Yeah, so we kind of had to add a couple more, but it wasn't too much. Yeah, it was, it was minimal. Cool. If there are no more questions, let's give our speaker one more round of applause. <laughs>